Here's where clickers would come in handy with about a minute or so, waiting for everybody to do their clicker response. Are you guys still interested in doing that? I like, I really like clickers, but it really slows things down. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe I should Well, this was an easy question, so hopefully everybody got it. The kind of question that might be on the exam. So far, sodium and potassium are not required for neurotransmitter release. You can evoke a postsynaptic response by directly depolarizing the presynaptic nerve. This doesn't mean that sodium and potassium are not important. Under normal conditions, you have to have sodium and potassium in multisensitive channels in order to conduct the action potential from the site of stimulation all the way down to the presynaptic nerve terminal to depolarize it in order to cause neurotransmitters to be released. That's how it normally works. But this is showing that the uh, presynaptic release mechanism is independent of sodium and potassium and requires something else. And that something else is very likely to be um, calcium. If you increase the extracellular calcium uh, concentration that the giant synapse is being bathed in, this increases the size of the postsynaptic response. If you reduce the, the extracellular calcium concentration, that reduces the size of the postsynaptic response. So there is an important role for calcium. So I want to go through a couple of experiments that sort of nail down the role of calcium, and then see if you agree with me at the end. So here's an experiment. It's, it's the giant synapse again, recording the postsynaptic membrane potential. The postsynaptic response is sort of like a bioassay for whether you know transmitter is being released at this chemical synapse. You can, for example, you can um, voltage clamp the presynaptic nerve terminals. several experiments. Voltage clamp the presynaptic nerve terminal and TTX and TEA to block all of the voltage sensitive sodium and potassium channels that are here. When you depolarize the presynaptic nerve terminal, under voltage clamp conditions, there's an inward current that you're recording in the presynaptic nerve terminal. Okay. And this inward current leads to a postsynaptic depolarization. You see, stimulus, inward current at the presynaptic nerve terminal, postsynaptic response. Okay. You can then remove the calcium from the extracellular solution, and you can replace it with another divalent cation, such as cadmium, which actually blocks the calcium channels. We haven't gotten there yet. And so when you do that, you uh, depolarize the presynaptic nerve terminal. You no longer record this inward current, and there's no postsynaptic response. So this is getting towards the idea that calcium is critical. An influx of positive charge, presumably carried by these calcium ions, is critical in order to elicit neurotransmitter release, which leads to a postsynaptic depolarization. Are we good so far? Here's another experiment involving the same setup with voltage plant, TTX and TDA present, so we block all voltage sensitive sodium and potassium channels. And what we're now doing is we're applying a presynaptic, um, we're presynaptically depolarizing, sorry, we're depolarizing the presynaptic nerve terminal in different, to different voltage levels. This shows a weak depolarization that's a very strong depolarization. And we're under patch time, we're recording the currents. Okay? And we can see that with each step of depolarization, we record an inward current that lasts as long as the depolarization is present. And then it basically stops when you stop depolarizing the nerve. So here, these are inward currents. The magnitude or the amplitude of this inward current is proportional to the size of depolarization. Okay? And then with each inward current, there's recorded a postsynaptic response, a polarization of the postsynaptic membrane. So for a weak inward current, there's a weak response. For a medium-sized inward current, you get a medium-sized response. For the largest stimulus, that it looks the largest inward current, leading to the largest postsynaptic response, which is, and this was about seven or eight millivolts, millivolts of amplitude. So this is the uh, current that's presumably carried by calcium ions entering into the cell through uh, 
have open sensor uh, calcium channels that have opened up and increased synaptic depolarization. Okay? All right. A few more experiments. If you inject calcium into the presynaptic neuron, this elicits a postsynaptic response. If you uh, stimulate the presynaptic neuron, you can record presynaptic depolarization, which is accompanied by a depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane here. If you then inject a buffer into the presynaptic nerve terminal that basically binds with calcium, chelates calcium, so calcium is no longer effective, and basically taking away calcium and presynaptic nerve terminal, this leads to a uh, almost complete um, reduction or abolition of the postsynaptic response. So we have a lot of pieces of evidence that together imply that influx of calcium into the presynaptic nerve terminal is essential in order to evoke a postsynaptic response to the release of neurotransmitters into the synaptic fiber. Good? So the, the basic idea of tying this all together is that in a, in a synapse, you have a presynaptic axon that comes down and invades into the presynaptic nerve terminal. When an action potential arrives at the presynaptic nerve terminal, the nerve terminal is massively depolarized, right? And this depolarization leads to the opening of voltage sensitive calcium channels that allow calcium to flow into the cell down its concentration gradient and also into a uh, presynaptic nerve terminal <coughs> normally at minus 70 millivolts or so. So this opens, uh, opens the calcium channels. There's an influx of calcium current and inward current. This, this is uh, upside down now. This is just, uh, I guess this represents the change, the depolarization of, of the membrane potential of the presynaptic nerve terminal as calcium falls in. It can be associated with a, a large, large inward current. And then shortly after this event occurs, neurotransmitters release, causing a, a neurotransmitter to bind to postsynaptic receptors opening ion channels, in this case, uh, allowing uh, positive charge to flow into the postsynaptic nerve, leading to a depolarization of the postsynaptic nerve. This depolarization is often referred to, it's often referred to as an excitatory postsynaptic response because it's a depolarizing voltage chain, right? And if you remember about the neuron, at a synapse or depolarize, at an excitatory synapse, you're depolarizing the postsynaptic cell. And so you're bringing that postsynaptic neuron closer to the threshold for firing action potentials at the axon hillock portion of that cell. And so because the depolarization can potentially lead to the cell uh, um, generating an action potential, it's called excitatory. It excites the neuron. So this is often referred to as an excitatory postsynaptic potential, or EPSP, which I'll come back to. So this is just a table I, I borrowed from a, a review paper showing that there are um, different uh, families of voltage-sensitive calcium channels. These days, they're referred to as CAV, calcium voltage-sensitive, CAV1, CAV2, and CAV3. And within each family, there are various subunits that uh, form together to form the calcium channel. They have different names depending on the pharmacology. There's an interesting N-type calcium channel that the presynaptic nerve terminals of, 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 of fibers that are involved in transmitting pain. So I, I'm particularly interested in these. But there are, are other different types of calcium channels as well. There are many, many different types of synapses. All of the presynaptic nerve fibers need some type of voltage-sensitive calcium channel in order to, uh, upon depolarization, open the channel to allow calcium in to promote the release of neurotransmitters. Are we good so far? Clear? Which ion is necessary in order for neurotransmitter release to occur? How many say A? How many say B? How many say C? How many say D? Good. Answer is C. Okay, so uh, so 
So I, I may have neglected to mention this. I, I'm not sure. In the, in the, uh, in the neuron, in the extracellular uh, bathing medium, extracellular fluid or the seawater, there's a rel there's a relatively high, relatively speaking, a high concentration of calcium compared to the concentration of calcium that's inside the cell. The concentration of calcium inside the presynaptic nerve terminal is typically kept very, very low. The calcium is low to begin with, and it tends to be so uh, soaked up by intracellular organelles, such as mitochondria and endo endoplasmic reticulum, thereby keeping the intracellular calcium concentration at a very, very low level, which makes sense because you don't want the neurons to be spontaneously releasing neurotransmitter because there's a lot of calcium floating around. You want to keep the calcium down. Calcium also interacts with other enzyme, other enzymatic processes, which you don't necessarily want to be occurring. So normally the intracellular calcium concentration is kept very low. So that it's a very large concentration gradient for calcium from the outside to the inside of the cell. Plus, the inside of the neuron is negative, it's hyperpolarized, it's like the resting membrane potential is maybe minus 70 millivolts. So like sodium, calcium has a strong electrical driving force and a strong chemical driving force to want to go into the cell. So when the calcium channels open up, it zips right in there as fast as it can. It has a very strong driving force. Okay. So now I want to talk about the causal release. So the idea is that the neurotransmitter is released in discrete packets, discrete amounts, discrete quanta. The idea being that uh, a quantum of neurotransmitter is that amount of neurotransmitter that's contained within one synaptic vesicle in the presynaptic neuron. And it makes sense because that's why the synaptic vesicles are there. There's lots of them. Each one contains a certain amount of neurotransmitter. When, it, when that vesicle binds or emerges with the presynaptic nerve terminal membrane, undergoes exocytosis, a certain amount of neurotransmitter is released out of that vessel. That's the concept of quantum release. So here's, a, um, here's another um, situation, experimental setup. This is now the neuromuscular junction. So this is a motor axon that makes a synapse onto muscle fibers. Why am I talking about this? Because this is, this is a model system. It's actually not that different from synapses in the brain. And so, since the neuromuscular junction is it's mammalian, but it's still larger than synapses in the brain, people like Bernard Katz and, other, and others have used that as a model for synaptic transmission in the brain, even though it's from a motor neuron to a muscle cell. Okay? So you can stimulate the presynaptic uh, motor axon and you can record postsynaptic responses in the muscle fiber that this motor axon is connected to synaptically. All right? So Bernard Katz actually did this experiment, and he basically took the neuromuscular junction preparation and he put it in a relatively low calcium medium so that the calcium concentration is relatively low. There's less of a driving force for calcium to go into the cell, but it's not zero. Calcium will still go into the cell as it can. It's just been reduced, okay? And under these conditions, he was able to record the so-called spontaneous miniature end plate so there's a spontaneous release of a neurotransmitter under low calcium conditions. You can record the postsynaptic response caused by the release of neurotransmitter. And the responses were always on the order of about 0.4 millivolts in amplitude. So here, this is, it's, this is a little bit exaggerated. This is a 0.4 millivolts. I think this should be something larger scale. And this is what he recorded most of the time. If, if nothing happened, when something happened, he would record these spontaneous miniature end plate potentials, or SNPs, with this constant amplitude of approximately 0.4 milliliters. Occasionally, he would record one that's a little bit bigger. And if you measure the amplitude of this one, it's two times the amplitude of the small one. So instead of 0.4 millivolts, it's 0.8 millivolts. And very rarely, he would record another uh, slightly larger spontaneous miniature end plate potential that would be either three or four times the amplitude of the, the, the 
like this one, which is 0.4. So 3 times 0.4 would be 1.2 millimoles in solar, okay? Which gives the idea that neurotransmitter is released in quantities that always elicit a postsynaptic response of approximately the same order of magnitude, about 0.4 millimoles. Yes? Generally not in between. Usually it's some multiple of 0 0.4. I'll come to that in the next slide. Okay? And further experiments suggested that this, this small amount of depolarization is not due to a single acetylcholine molecule. And we know today that a single molecule, actually two molecules interacting with the two alpha subunits of a single uh, postsynaptic receptor evokes the inward current is very, very small, which will amount to a depolarization in the microvolt phase, not in the millivolt phase. We also know that um, these uh, endplate, these individual endplate potentials don't change in size. No, they, they can change. It's not, don't worry about that. It's not on the exam. <laughs> Just remember that they're usually um, used to the same magnitude more or less invariant, all right? And so this is a, sort of an extension of the experiment that Bernard Katz was doing at the neuromuscular junction. I think it's from a frog, a very, uh, a very good model for synaptic transmission. He ended up winning a Nobel Prize for his work back in the 1960s. So this shows the same, the same uh, experiment. The only difference is that now the recording miniature input so the miniature end plate potential at the neuromuscular junction is the same as an excited, a miniature excitatory postsynaptic potential at a synapse in the brain. So a, a, a synapse, a net is like an EPSB. Okay? So now under conditions of low calcium, he's now stimulating the presynaptic neuron, trying to cause it to release neurotransmitters under conditions of very low calcium. So because the calcium concentration externally is very low, many times when he stimulates the presynaptic nerve terminal, there's no response. He doesn't record anything. Okay? He's trying to break down synaptic transmission to the bare minimum by blocking, blocking by 90, 99%. But the 1% of the time when a presynaptic stimulus does elicit a postsynaptic response, he records either a, a, a postsynaptic response is on the order of 0 0.4 millivolts or some multiple. So here, here is 0 0.4 millivolts. So when, when, this, when the uh, neurotransmitter is released, it's often not, but when it is, it's released in, in an amount that evokes a depolarizing response of 0 0.4 millivolts. Or occasionally, 0.8 millivolts, which is two times and then sometimes 1.3, which would be three times this quantal size, sometimes 1.6, which would be four times, and so on and so forth. And so he, he, he fitted the data to a uh, Poisson distribution, which is a mathematical model that indicates that the responses are in multiples of 0 0.4 millivolts. Okay? So, the Poisson model also in, uh, indicates that the quanta are released independently. So two quanta are released to get 0.8, and so forth. You get the idea, right? So if you saw this picture on an exam, what point, what, what point would you get from this? <coughs> the synaptic release of neurotransmitter, when it occurs, occurs in it's a, a postsynaptic response that's 0.4 millivolts, or some multiple of that. Okay? All right. All right, so, so far, we have um, these spontaneous miniature endplate potentials. We have uh, evoked responses that are a multiple of 0.4 millivolts. We know that the presynaptic nerve terminal contains these, these vesicles, that are like round globe-like structures, not spheres. And so it's very, it's very, um, what's the right word? It's very attractive to suggest that when this synaptic vesicle 
releases its content by exocytosis to the response. The consequence of that is that the neurotransmitter, the number of neurotransmitter molecules released invoke a postsynaptic response of 0.4 milligrams, right? Make sense? And that's generally what, I mean, that's what we think is true today. But it made sense back at the time. And so it's possible to take a synapse, uh, like the neuromuscular junction of a frog, or even a central nervous system synapse, and you can basically take that synapse and stimulate it, or they have it at rest or stimulate it, at the moment when you're stimulating it, put it in nitrogen, in liquid nitrogen, freeze it, and then you take this frozen tissue, you're trying to catch, catch the synapse in the act of neurotransmission, okay? And you can freeze that tissue and then you can split, you can basically section through the synapse and look at it under the electron microscope. And so now you see a similar picture, right? This is the presynaptic uh, nerve fiber. This is the postsynaptic cell. Here's the, this is the synaptic cleft here. And you can see that if you captured, captured the synapse at a time when it was stimulated, and then you freeze it in that moment, you can see that some of these synaptic vesicles have been caught in the act of fusing with the, the presynaptic nerve membrane, which is here, okay? uh, opening, up, opening up so that the inside of the synaptic vesicle is exposed to the synaptic cleft, which then presumably allows the contents of the synaptic vesicle to diffuse out of the synaptic vesicle into the synaptic cleft, cleft where they can swim across and bind with receptors on the postsynaptic side. So these are often referred to as um, omega structures because they sort of look like an omega. So um, these structures are highly suggestive of exocytosis. Right at the point when they're exocytosis or undergoing exocytosis. So uh, this this is looking at it sort of from the side view like this. You could also get look, take a more three dimensional view of the synapse. So here's the uh, here's the presynaptic nerve terminal membrane here. And you can sort of split it, so lipid bilayers, you can sort of split it apart. Here is a synaptic vesicle that is caught in the act of undergoing exocytosis, right here, right, this omega structure. And you can sort of peel off the, um, you can peel off the underside of this lipid bilayer. At, at the point where these, these synaptic vesicles are undergoing exocytosis, if you peel off and look at the, the inner, the, uh, the second layer of the lipid bilayer, you see these craters, and these craters represent holes in the lipid bilayer where this, this uh, synaptic vesicle has basically fused with the presynaptic nerve terminal, and is now, the inside of the vesicle is now um, basically continuous with the synaptic cleft, all right? Do so you see what we're looking at here? The synaptic vesicles that are not undergoing exocytosis are sort of sitting on the membrane, and they form these pits. These pits are where the, where the synaptic vesicles are sitting. They're docked at the membrane. I'll talk about docking in just a second. But synaptic vesicles are close to the presynaptic nerve terminal membrane, so they're available when calcium gets in. When calcium gets in, some of them that are close to the nerve terminal membrane uh, undergo exocytosis, and that's what we're capturing here. We look at these craters and these pits. The pits are not exocytosing. The craters are, are synaptic vesicles that are undergoing exocytosis. That's what I'm trying to say. You got that? Okay. And so this is at rest. You see all these uh, small pits. So none of the pre none of the synaptic vesicles are actually forming a hole. This hole is called a fusion pore. So there's no pore in the membrane between the synaptic vesicle and the outside of the membrane. But if you stimulate the membrane, if you stimulate the synapse, and then you quickly freeze it while it's still active, so you sort of freeze it at the moment where you know, transmitter is being released, and then you, you uh, do what's called a freeze fracture, you sort of fracture the membrane so you can see this, this underbelly, the underbelly, the, uh, this outer portion of the lipid bilayer, it has these craters in it. You can see that there are a lot of large craters so that means that a lot of the symmetric vesicles are undergoing exocytosis 
because it's actively releasing the neurotransmitter. And you can see that. And somebody did an incredible experiment. It must have been extremely tedious. Look at the axis. Thousands. Thousands. Somebody actually counted the number of craters in these synaptic vesicles for a unit area, right? Trying to get a measure. And what they did is they uh, added a drug, foraminopyridine. So foraminopyridine blocks potassium, multi-sensitive potassium channels. What effect would that have on a a, an action potential that's arriving at the presynaptic nerve terminal? Prolonging, which means it's depolarized for a longer period of time, right? Which means more calcium comes in through the multi-sensitive calcium channels that are open, as long as the membrane is depolarized. More calcium gets in, there's a greater amount of neurotransmitter release, there's a greater number of synaptic vesicles that are forming these fusion pores uh, in, with the presynaptic membrane to allow neurotransmitter to diffuse out into the synaptic cleft, right? And so they actually counted <laughs> the number of these craters that are in the, the underbelly of this um, presynaptic nerve terminal as a function of uh, orbinopurian concentration. And you can see that as you increase the duration of the X potential, there's a relatively linear increase in the number of these craters that are observed under the electron microscope. Incredible experiment. So they found that the number of fused vesicles, uh, vesicle openings captured, so these craters, is correlates um, linearly in this case with the number of quantum beads. And if you think the quantum is 0.4 millivolts, calculate that, you can see that there's a nice correlation between the amount of membrane depolarization and the number of synaptic vesicles that form these fusion pores to release neurotransmitter. Okay, are we good so far? All right. So this, this is me trying to figure it out. So here's a, here's a receptor. This could be a acetylcholine, a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Other receptors are like it. They have hexameric structures. They have alpha subunits. The alpha subunits are typically the, the part of the, the subunits of the receptor that binds to the neurotransmitter.